I spent six months of trial and error developing my own FOC driver. Field-oriented control unleashes the full potential of a BLDC motor, but because it weaves together many technical disciplines, the learning curve can be steep. In this video, I'll break down everything I learned, both the electronics and the control theory, so the next wave of beginners can understand FOC quickly and put it to work. All right, let's get started, but jumping straight into FOC can feel overwhelming. So in this video, I'll break the road to FOC down into three clear steps. Follow along and we'll build your understanding one stage at a time. In step one, we'll understand space vectors and inverter circuits through the most basic method, six step commutation. A BLDC motor has three phase wires. By tying each phase either to VCC or to ground, you create eight possible voltage patterns. Each pattern maps to a voltage vector, as shown in the diagram. Patterns 000 and 111 drive all phases to the same potential, so the phase-to-phase -phase voltage is zero. These are the zero vectors. Take pattern 001 as an example. It produces the vector you see here. Because of the winding inductance, the current vector lags a bit, and a stator magnetic field forms in that same direction. The rotor magnets are pulled toward this field, rotate, and lock there. Cycle through the six active patterns in order, and you keep dragging the rotor around the circle. That, in a nutshell, is six-step commutation, the most basic way to spin a BLDC. Next, let's design the minimal hardware that can pull off six-step commutation. We start with a power source, a four-cell LiPo pack that delivers 16.8 volts at full charge. The brains of the system is an STM32 microcontroller, which runs at 3.3 volts, so we drop the battery down with a buck converter. Because the STM32's GPIO pins can't drive a motor directly, we need an inverter stage to boost those tiny signals. In the schematic, you see a dual-channel gate driver paired with two MOSFETs. Turn the high-side MOSFET on and the low-side off, and the phase node rises to VCC, Reverse them and the node is pulled to ground. Choose a driver whose second channel is the inverted version of the first, and a single MCU pin can command both MOSFETs at once. Build three identical inverter blocks and connect each one to a motor phase. With that, the MCU can switch any of the BLDC's three phase leads to VCC or ground whenever it likes. Here's the actuator running at low speed under six-step control. It does turn, but the vibration is obvious. The reason becomes clear when we look at the equation for the torque acting on the rotor. Because six-step commutation changes the drive voltage in discrete jumps, the load angle delta rises and falls suddenly, and the torque oscillates. This torque ripple can loosen screws, inject noise into sensors, and generally make the system loud and inefficient. To get rid of that vibration, the next technique I'll introduce is SVPWM. With six-step commutation, we simply toggled the MCU pins high or low, but SVPWM uses center-aligned PWM instead. That is, a PWM waveform whose on time is mirrored around the middle of each period. The duty cycle of each phase can be updated in software at runtime. Imagine generating three such PWM signals at 100,000 hertz. If you zoom in on a single PWM period, the switching sequence along the three phases is 000, 001, 011, 111, 111, 011, 001, 001. Repeat that pattern 100,000 times per second and the motor sees the average of those four vectors. By tuning the dwell time of each vector, you can synthesize any magnitude and direction you like. And that, in a nutshell, is what SVPWM is all about. Because SVPWM can generate an arbitrary vector, we can rotate that vector smoothly. When the voltage vector turns smoothly, the current vector, the stator field, and the rotor field follow it without abrupt jumps, keeping the angle between the fields constant and eliminating torquey ripple. Here you can see the actuator running under SVPWM. There's virtually no vibration, just a silky rotation. The beauty of SVPWM is that it requires no extra hardware. A firmware change alone makes the BLDC dramatically smoother. But SVPWM still doesn't squeeze out the motor's full potential. Look again at the torque equation. Maximum efficiency is achieved when the angle delta between the stator field and the rotor field is ideally 90 degrees, because that produces the greatest torque for the least current. SVPWM can keep delta steady, but it can't set delta to any value we like. The control scheme that continuously forces delta to 90 degrees, driving current in the most efficient direction relative to the rotor field, is the topic of the next section, field-oriented control. You're probably ready for a break from all this theory, so let's pause here and walk through how to build the FOC driver PCB. 
Once you unzip the file you downloaded from GitHub, you'll find another zip file inside. That's the PCB manufacturing file. Click the JLC PCB link in the description, choose the six layer PCB option, and drag and drop that zip straight onto the quote page. That's all it takes to place the order. JLC PCB is the perfect place to order your PCBs. They offer one-stop services including PCB manufacturing, assembly, and component sourcing. With an impressive turnaround time as fast as 24 hours, JLC PCB is the first choice for time-constrained projects. With over 5 million global users, JLC PCB is trusted by engineers and hobbyists for their high-quality, reliable PCBs. As a new JLC PCB user, you can grab coupons worth up to 60 USD. Check out what JLC PCB can do for you at the link below. The board showed up in about 10 days, and the finish is absolutely flawless. I've posted the full parts list on GitHub, so grab your components from there. Spread some solder paste, set the parts in place, and reflow the board on a hot plate. After a quick power-up test, everything worked exactly as expected. If you haven't already, give JLC PCB's high-quality boards a try in your own projects. Now it's time to dive into field-oriented control. FOC's goal is to keep the stator and rotor magnetic fields perfectly perpendicular at every instant. Because the stator field aligns with the current vector and its strength is proportional to current, we can restate the goal as keep the current vector perpendicular to the rotor field. That phrasing is more practical since current is easy to measure while the stator field is not. Here's the feedback loop of FOC control. Let's take a closer look at each step. First, we'll look at how to measure the rotor position. I embed a radial magnet in the back of the rotor and mount a magnetic encoder directly in front of it. Because the magnet is polarized across its diameter, the encoder can read its orientation and report the mechanical angle as a 12-bit value, 0 to 4095 counts. That raw count is sent to the microcontroller over SPI and converted to a physical angle with this formula. The radial magnet, however, is not perfectly aligned with the rotor's own magnetic field, so we must measure an offset once and use it forever after. To do that, I drive the motor with an SVPWM voltage vector pointing in a known reference direction and hold it long enough for the rotor field to settle into alignment. I then read the encoder value, store it, and call it the electrical angle offset. During the control loop, we plug the measured angle into this equation and out comes the correct electrical angle. Next, we need to measure the phase currents. I place three shunt resistors in the low side of the half bridges. The few millivolts that drop across each shunt are amplified by a bi-directional current sense amplifier and then sampled by the STM32's 12-bit ADC. So the ADC gives us a value between 0 and 4095, and the current is then calculated using this formula. In my setup, the voltage on the MCU's V-Ref pin measures 3.263 volts with a multimeter. The amplifier gain is 50, and each shunt is 2 milliohms, so the formula simplifies to the one you see here. The term zero val is the average of about 200 ADC readings taken with no current flowing. It defines the boundary between positive and negative current. When I spin the motor at constant speed under SVPWM and plot the three phase currents, their amplitudes don't match perfectly. That mismatch comes from tolerance errors in the shunts and amplifiers, so I apply a gain correction to each channel, tweaking the values while watching the waveforms. Because the sum of the three phase currents should be zero in theory, I also subtract their average to remove any global offset. After that, the three phase current waveforms line up cleanly. Next, we run the measured phase currents through a Clark transform and then a Park transform to compute ID and IQ. Use the electrical angle theta E that we derived earlier. This splits the current vector into two DC signals, ID, which aligns with the rotor field, and IQ, which is perpendicular to it. Finally, we apply a low-pass filter to both channels to remove noise. Next, we use a PI controller to push ID and IQ toward their set points. The target for ID is zero, while IQ is driven to IQ ref, which acts as the torque command. DT is the control loop period, and the gains KP and KI are tuned empirically while the motor is running. Now we have UD and UQ, but because they're defined in the DQ frame, we still run an inverse park followed by an inverse Clark transform to turn them into the three phase voltages. We now have the target phase voltages. Using these equations, we calculate the duty cycle for each pin so that SVPWM can produce those voltages. Once the PWM signals are driven, the FOC loop is finished. 
By now, the concrete steps for implementing FOC should be much clearer. Throughout this development, one piece of equipment has been especially helpful, the FNRC 2C53T, which FNRC kindly provided free of charge for this project. The 2C53T is a compact instrument that combines a two-channel oscilloscope and a multimeter, and it has proven invaluable at every stage of the FOC implementation. Whether I need to measure the ADC reference voltage with precision, inspect the SVPWM waveform to confirm it's being generated correctly, or track down unstable current sensor readings to decide whether the issue is in software or hardware, the 2C53T is my go-to tool. If you're curious, follow the link in the description to learn more. I wanted to test the actuator with the newest FOC driver, but out of the blue, it stopped working. For today's algorithm tests, I'm reverting to the previous version. The circuitry is almost identical, so it's still more than adequate for validating the control logic. As you can see, forward and reverse rotation, as well as low and high speed operation, all work flawlessly. Unfortunately, I still don't see proper regulation of ID and IQ. For example, when I change the target IQ, ID strangely drifts instead. The most likely culprits are hardware related. Either the signal wires are paired incorrectly, or the current sensing pins don't match the PWM outputs. I've tried several fixes, but I haven't pinned down the exact cause yet. The good news is that a new robot actuator, running on an updated FOC driver, is on the way, complete with a full demonstration of everything working as intended. Look forward to that video. If you haven't subscribed yet, make sure to do so and stay tuned for the next upload. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.